Thank you. So uh, I think uh, the last message was um, that the president actually shared with the room was that growth is possible um, with low carbon trajectories. That's the plea that he has made, that we can manage the challenge of climate change, we can maintain high growth, and we can have shared prosperity. I think we, similar, we have a similar trilemma in the digital space as well. Security, privacy, and economic growth. And this tension, this dynamic between affording every user his private space, between affording nation states a secure ecosystem, and affording economic growth at the same time, has created multiple tensions amongst various actors. And I will start with posing three of them. I think Jane was marvelous this morning. He is, she has actually provided us the point of departure in some ways for this conversation. But let me talk about three trends which uh, we should discuss in this panel as we try to explore the idea of creating trustworthy tech and allow people to embrace technology with greater uh, gusto and, and uh, freedom. The first trend clearly is that the open space and the free space and the avant-garde and the, the hippie space, uh, we were called the tech hippies when, we, when I was an engineer, that the space is gone. Technology has dramatically changed. The states don't see this as that space anymore. They see this as a political space, as an economic space. They see it as a geopolitical space. And the states are beginning to find new ways to exert control over that space. And underneath all the garb of conversation around privacy and rights, there are sovereigns determining, determining the terms of engagement in that space. Sometimes supra sovereigns for, sovereigns, for example, I always argue the GDPR was the European attempt to control and regulate a fairly open and free space. The Chinese have done it longer. The Indians are following suit with their own regulation. The Californians, the sub-sovereigns, have also begun to exert control over a space that they believe they should regulate. So that's the first trend. The second is this space has also now been conflated with the geopolitical tensions. Trade, technology, and geopolitics are no longer distinct. Donald Trump has uh, given this uh, uh, space a new flavor by actually using this as a place where he's negotiating with China the terms of the 21st century. It's happening on technology, around technology. And the third trend, of course, is um, around innovation and, and companies and corporations who are doing two things. One, they are strengthening the state in some cases, and in other, they are providing solutions to escape the state. So companies are doing both. There are companies who are trying to protect and defend personal space and freedom, but there are uh, equal number, if not more, of uh, private actors who are defending the status quo with the state as a dominant actor. I want you all to think about this and respond to some of the queries that I'm going to post to you. Let me start with Nanjira. Nanjira is a, uh, one of the uh, fierce uh, uh, commentators and thinkers in this space. She was part of the United Nations Secretary General's high-level panel on the digital economy. And I will turn to you first. I will introduce the rest of you as I come to you. Um, Nanjira, the UNSG, uh, in his earlier messaging before the HLP was constituted, wanted to create a multi-stakeholder framework to try and address the challenges to ensure the vibrancy of the digital economy. That was something he had mentioned once in a speech that he had given to some of us at some point. Post that HLP, you have submitted your final report, and we'll be hearing from Amandeep uh, later uh, tomorrow. But post that report, do you believe that this HLP has been able to respond to these three dynamics and has been able to create a basis for citizens and small companies and states to trust technology more? Wow. <laughs> well, what I can say we were able to do is just try and create, um, I guess, a consensus, if you will, around the fact that it's an age of digital interdependence. Um, very much in the same way we're just hearing about climate change as well, tech could contribute to that as well. So really linking the space, the, perme the permeating nature of digital technologies to practically all spheres of life. And showing the interdependence that states, um, big or small, developing, developed, whatever you want to call them, uh, companies, big and small, multinationals or SMEs, or civil society in all stripes, cooperatives, more institutionalized ones, all have to find, either build new tables to come together and converse about these issues, or you know, reform the spaces that already exist to make them work. 
And so from the UN Secretary General's perspective, it was how do we still have the space of the multilateral approach that the UN is well known for intersecting with this whole idea of multi-stakeholder? How do we go beyond the silos that exist? Even within technology alone, you'll have the geopolitical element playing out very differently in cybersecurity as it would say in infrastructure uh, investment. And how do you start breaking those silos to have some co conversations? Because what we all do in our different spheres is influencing each other. So I think just giving that baseline is really all we could do because again, the very things you mentioned the geopolitics, constituting 20 people from all over the world, from different walks of life, gender, age, you name it, um, finding consensus. We were like, if, we, if we, we, we all talk, I think, most times, but that's the future of what it's supposed to look like. So it was trying to lead by example, trying to put, to, get, uh, to put forward something that is not prescriptive, because I don't think anybody can stand here today, no, no, no matter your geopolitical history and uh, standpoint, and speak to people with a prescriptive manner. It's really just putting forward some examples or modalities for people to actually build consensus around to go forward. Else the strong arming tactics are just not going to work in the digital age and we just might see multipolar, uh, splintered, uh, what they call a splinter net and technologies that instead of connecting people will actually drive us apart. So that's what we try to work towards. So uh, let me ask you something more on that particular effort by the UNSG. There is some commentaries and criticism some support as well, on two kinds of participants who were present on that high-level panel. Um, one, uh, of course, the private sector, and there was a uh, criticism that uh, when you have the chair who is, uh, uh, belongs to a large tech company, um, how daring and how uh, uh, provocative could the report be in testing uh, the accountability that the private sector must be put to? That's one criticism. Uh, there's support that it's time to bring the private sector onto the table because they are, they, like uh, Jane was mentioning, they are the largest uh, influencers in this space, so you need their voice. So that's one conversation. The second was uh, uh, how many participants uh, in that group uh, came from the African continent or, say, from uh, uh, even the subcontinent in India? Right. Ah, geopolitics represented. So... <clears throat> What was very interesting, we had a nine month tenure, and by the way, just to mention, you can find the report on digitalcooperation.org. It's really recommended as a read. We try to make it as narrative as possible just to bring more people to the conversation. Um, while we, well, during the tenure of the panel, even the whole idea of the role of private sector was changing rapidly in the conversations that were happening from all the violations we're learning about from big tech companies, uh, to the shift in mood that even they started calling for the very regulation that they, previously even when we were constituted would not have, that would not have been a term to bring up in the conversation. So um, I, the way I see it right now, it's never going to be easy to create any setting where you, tr again, are trying to bring all these different stakeholders from different geographies, from different setups, and have a constitution that everybody agrees upon, whether it's, some might say it's too government heavy, some might say it's too civil society heavy. We made do and we made sure that, um, any of us who was on the table actually brought that perspective and there were some great smackdowns um, of those who came with very particular perspectives. And on the private sector conversation, especially the digital technologies, it's the one space we're starting to see that um, what would have been perceived as public goods being advanced through digital technologies are increasingly being provided by private sector players. Uh, so much so we do have companies that have greater GDPs than entire countries altogether. So that does mean the way we start thinking about engaging with them is not just deference to them, but starting to infuse new forms of accountability, and we try to bring that to that conversation. Um, on the constitution of the panel, we were three Africans, uh, all women. Um, and from the Indian subcontinent, we had, of course, one of the executive uh, directors of the panel, Amandeep, uh, Ambassador An Amandeep Gill, on it. Of course, the geopolitics of representation remained very interesting. The thing was, with those of us who had the space on the table, how much could we make sure that, you know, as it always goes, you make sure views are represented, you're not being talked at, you're not the punctuation in a sentence. And I must say that must be something everybody remembers, especially as we're talking about um, this global consensus that we all need to talk to have or interdependencies. Um, too often places like Africa or so-called developing nations are the punctuation in the sentence. You're the audience being talked at. Well, what we always say now is well, if, you, if that's the, the order, we just either break the table, build a new one, or just move right on and listen to everybody. <laughs> no, but, uh, but on a quick, uh, a short reply from you. How acceptable or how read is this report in this continent? Not well, I will say that. 
Um, and that remains a, a, maybe a conversation about whether in the past and how the developments of digital technologies have considered um, even our policy. Let me even just focus on folks engaged in the policy and diplomacy space. When they go to the meetings that are happening in New York and Geneva, whether they're even invited is one thing, whether their perspectives are given light of day for conversation or they're again being talked at is another. And those are the signals that do translate to the kind of work like this does. I mean, I think the one of the most interesting questions has been whether people like myself being on the panel and being vocal is starting to signal that people should you know, elbow their way in, and that remains to be seen. But, you know, the work ahead is now to socialize it here um, and see whether people can adopt it in different countries and uh, sort of like configurations can adopt it to say this is something we can build upon going forward based on the issues, challenges, and opportunities we're seeing with digital technologies in our region or country or continent. And would you argue, argue therefore, that people still trust the government when it comes to tech policy more? People don't trust. I don't know. That. Trust is, a, I think the, SG, the Secretary General put it best. There's a trust deficit disorder globally. We do not trust governments. We do not trust each other. We do not trust private sector, but we need to build trust. And I think it was Jane earlier who talked about how do we build trust from a space of distrust. It's a big challenge of our time today. But to do that, it's also that there's a humility element around how history has shaped who gets to be seen as a voice, who gets to be heard, who gets to, 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 uh, to, uh, to wail and suddenly everybody stops and all that. So those, <laughs> those are the little things. The, the trust we're looking for, we're not going to build an app for it. We're not going to build, per se, a new order. It's really going back to the space of conversations and humility to make sure that we actually, these values we always write out are actually being embodied. Now, everybody wants to build a blockchain app for it. It's not, not going to work, so that's <laughs> what Excellent. it is. Ajijola, let me come to you. Yes, and let me ask you, uh, you sit on the Global Commission for the Stability of Cyberspace. Uh, you, that's also a multi-stakeholder group, not sanctioned by the UNSG, but self-sanctioned to uh, try and explore norms and. Um, ideas that can keep the space trustworthy, maintain integrity, and promote its adoption, right? Now, uh, the simple poser to you is, the foreign minister this morning suggested that it's time for an African design, Absolutely. right? Uh, and Nanjira just told us that the African design was not necessarily prevalent in the conversations in New York. My question to you is that is the idea of a design sufficient, or is there time for the countries here? And you were uh, a member of an interregional group as well, so, and that's why I'm posing the question to you, that is there a possibility and is there a need of a regional normative framework that can be shared with the world? And does that regional normative framework respond to the central question of building trust between user and tech? Well, I think the quick, the, the, the quick answer is that it's imperative. So it, it, it's not really a question of choice. Um, there are a lot of, as you said, norms conversations going on. Uh, you've mentioned the GCSE of which myself, Jane Lute, and yourself actually, oh, uh, for, for the sake of transparency, uh, are part of. But you were the one, if I recollect, in our first meeting said, you know, the commission is rather pale. <laughs> <laughs> and this is, I think, goes to the crux of some, the, the issues my, my colleague has brought up. Um, those of us in the audience, um, if you have studied history, in 1884, there was a conference in Berlin. And basically, that conference led to the partition of Africa. That is why a country like Rwanda is the shape it is. That's why your lingua franca is the shape it is, or it is whatever it is. Uh, that's why Congo is the shape, lingua franca, culture, perceptions, um, our telecoms has to go to France before going to England, before coming back to Nigeria, on and on and on and on. And I would argue that this, the norms development process is something similar to this conference of 1884 in Berlin, where cyberspace itself arguably is being divvied up. And so the, the question that arises is for Africa, you know, where are we in this conversation? And I think as correctly pointed out, this is not something that the world is going to wait for us. It, it, the world goes on. And um, Chairman Joshi, yourself, and particularly the minister, I think have emphasized why this particular dialogue in Africa is so important. Um, I would even go a few steps further than the minister. For example, in cyberspace, in cyber war, in artificial intelligence, what is African philosophy? 
you know, what are our African strategies? What do we want? What are going to be our ethics? What is going to be, or what are going to be our um, tactics? What are going to be our accountability frameworks? Very honestly, nobody is going to come here from Tel Aviv, from London, from New York, or frankly, from wherever, and be able to articulate what we need to articulate. And we have to understand, it's not simply about um, wants, it's about needs. What do we really need? What do we need to extract? What type of norms are in our interest? Of course, many of the norms, for example, at the GCSC, we've articulated um, eight norms. One of them is on the protection of the public core. So those are the things like the domain name system of the internet. Now, if that goes down, yes, all of us are online, offline. So we need that kind of norm. We've also articulated a norm on non-interference in elections, which comes back to part of our thematic here. This is important. But the question is, what norms are from the African perspective? And this is my challenge, particularly to the Africans in the audience, and if I'm to broaden it a little bit, what are the South-South norms? What do we need to articulate as people from the global South? So I think um, this is very, very important. Okay, can, I, can I just <laughs> yes. uh, uh, interject here? When you said our norms, they're mm. African norms. Uh, it, it, this is not monolithic, right? You have entrepreneurs in Africa who are building wealth and value from technology. You have users in Africa Correct. who are being included for the first time in their lives, sometimes being discriminated against because they are now online. Yes. You have uh, different groups seeking different um, uh, uh, treatment of this particular space. So. Uh, uh, you know, it, it is all right for governments. Uh, my, okay, let me put it another way. I, my fear is that as soon as we start uh, a rather passionate exercise of building an African consensus, mm -hmm. you would actually be building government's consensus for Africa. And that, that, I agree with you, is a risk. But really, I'm talking about the African, not necessarily the, 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 the public servant. And I think this brings us to an issue. Um, in our conversations in our thinking, there are actually two particular groups that are not here today. Um, they're not represented really in any meaningful sense. And who are those groups? Well, first, the first group is uh, people who are not connected. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, the people who are not connected, where are most of them? The global south. Africa in particular has a high number of unconnected people. Guess what? Many of them are women. So they have to be considered. The next group that is not here to advocate for anything are those who are not yet born. And the truth of the matter is, like the 1888 conference, they are going to have to live with the consequences and the precedents we set in these kind of conversations. So while I agree with you, there is a very, very serious risk that we have to mitigate to make sure that it's not an exclusive government-centric activity, um, it is very important, I think, as Africans and as people from the global south, that we engage not just in the conversations at the global level, but start with articulating what are our own philosophy, ethics, strategy, tactics, accountability frameworks, and so on, from our perspectives, so that when we go to the table, we have a position to discuss from. The other dimension of technology that I want to discuss uh, and that is relevant to this region, this country, and certainly the continent, and, and perhaps even the other developing countries, is, uh, some would argue, a transformation in terms of the relationship between the government and citizens, delivery of government services, yes. um, and uh, the general increase in efficiency of uh, delivery of various provisions by the government to the citizens. And sometimes this is also, um, in many ways, uh, one of the most attractive features of technology for many who adopt it. Uh, if you were to get subsidies because you are online, you want to be online. If you were to get uh, uh, certain um, provisions from the government into your bank accounts, if you have a, a mobile banking, you want to be on the mobile. Now, Faith, um, you work uh, uh, in a private, co private sector company that is uh, the intermediary 
between the government and citizens in Rwanda. And let me ask you a couple of questions, and then I want to go to Mozilla after that, and, and uh, sorry, Kathleen after that. Uh, and uh, she is Miss Mozilla for me. But, but uh, uh, and they, are not, they have not sponsored any conference of mine. Uh, 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 so Faith, how eager, and what is the level of excitement that you see for citizens in Rwanda to uh, engage platforms such as yours to feel more connected and closer to government? Yes, um, thank you very much. I think I would like to start by echoing what my colleague just said about what is it that people really need, right? And um, one of the things that was surprising for me when I first moved back um, to Rwanda, I was in Silicon Valley first, and then I was in Kigali. Privacy is a huge topic in America about how can we make people's data more private and that sort of thing. And then coming to Rwanda, where people will go on the street and give their national ID, phone number, email address, everything, to someone just so they can help them get a service, right? So people need service. They need it delivered efficiently, cost-effectively, on time, right? And then um, this concern about privacy, it's very important, especially now and in the future, but it's not a concern for people that need something delivered today. So as we engage in global conversations and almost verbatim adopt other people's concerns ahead of our own concerns, it creates a challenge. Um, so my experience in Rwanda particularly is actually that we don't have a trust deficit disorder at all. In fact, we have too much trust. <laughs> If you see, but I think that that's because our government has been, um, it has been trustworthy, right? It has a, a, has a track record of putting citizens first, at least where it comes to service delivery. And um, I think that as the first platform in Rwanda to be wildly used, we have over 8 million users um, that come to us for driving licenses, birth certificates, health insurance, and all sorts of services. Um, we see this as an opportunity to start to actually educate people about what the potential side effects could be of too much trust in the long run. So now we are doing some um, education and sensitization around um, doing things yourself. So don't go through an intermediary or agent. This is simple. We put in on, in on many platforms like USSD and other sorts of them, which are not that secure as well, but we will work eventually to put people on mobile apps and other platforms. Um, and then uh, teach them around what data is important, what data is not important, what the potential risks are. But, but I see this as something that is gonna go on as people become more ICT literate. But for now, they just need their services delivered. If I'm in the middle of nowhere and USSD is the only platform I can access my health insurance, it doesn't matter that it's not that secure. Like, what is the potential risk if I don't have the healthcare I need? So I think that that has been, for me, the most interesting thing to see that people actually want things delivered and then the rest of us need to worry about the security and the privacy on those platforms. There are other platform, platforms in East Africa and other parts of Africa who are deliver, delivering similar forms of services to their citizens. Uh, does your organization have any conversation with these multiple platforms in the continent to try and come up with some shared uh, normative framework for provision of services, protection of privacy, protection of data? Um, the type of model that we have in Rwanda today is actually quite unique in that um, in most other um, countries on the continent, you've, you find every institution in the, in the government agency has their own web platform and then they deliver their own one or two, three services on it. And it's actually quite similar to America where you have to go to the DMV and line up all day. So in Rwanda where we have all these things on one platform, we have over 95 services on one platform today. It's very, very unique. We don't really have a similar um, platform. M maybe other type of services like e-commerce, I don't know, but um, not in the government space. So in a way we are being challenged by the government to create standards around this and say like, okay, so how do we regulate you? Or how do we, um, help you be innovative but while considering users. So we are coming up with various frameworks with the Rwandan government that they can use to work with us and um, manage how we manage citizens' data. You know, Faith, I just want to leave, I don't know this is a tough question, but I want to put this to you. Uh, is there a sense uh, that we perhaps may now need external auditors to review the performance of the platform um, is there any 
funnel where the more informed citizens are able to share their concerns with you? And is that beginning to shape the evolution of this service generally? Yeah. Um, OK, I'll answer the second part first, <laughs> auditors. Uh, well, but for the citizens themselves, we now have platforms like Twitter and Facebook and all those places. And um, citizens don't just use government services. They use other services, other private services. So then they go there and they have a certain level of service delivery efficiency. And then they'll come and say, like, you're not delivering. And they'll go on Twitter and they'll tag our president and they will not be good for But him. none of them come to you and say that the level of privacy you offer or the level of protection that you offer is not meeting the private standards. Do they say that to you sometimes? I haven't really um, had that, but we do have that with global um, users because we do offer visas on our platform or um, uh, NGO registration services that require a lot of background information about owners and that sort of thing. So we do sometimes have Europeans that do ask serious questions about if I give you this data, how safe is it? And then we have to walk them through our I mean, we adhere to um, the European data protection for their citizen standards. So um, Rwanda also has a strong data protection uh, policy, but now trying to get it more use useful for people to really understand what are my protections in this, what can I ask for, and that sort of thing. It, that conversation is just not there yet. Kathleen, let me turn to you. I think Faith has provided a very interesting perspective. You are getting services. You are getting various benefits. What is there not to trust? Are, is Kathleen promoting, and Kathleen is uh, uh, one of the leads who promotes um, the, uh, consumer protection and rights and liberty at the Mozilla Foundation, at the Mozilla itself. And um, she's, of course, been a regular participant at most global conversations where um, uh, governments have literally been hauled over the coals. And uh, some of the private sector companies have also found those conversations interesting, to say the least. Now, I'm going to put you on the spot here, and I'm going to ask you, are you trying to impose first world concerns on third world realities or emerging world, uh, developed world concerns? That's what Ajijal also mentioned in some ways. Are you trying to bring your sensibility using bits and bytes and, and overwhelm me with your uh, context? So here it is, someone who didn't have an insurance now has an insurance, and now you are more worried about whether it's privacy, whether you know, data is protected, whether the uh, server is of a certain specification. Is there a context distortion rather than a trust distortion taking place? Context distortion or trust distortion? Um, I don't think there's an easy answer to that. Like, I think the way that I approach my work, or one of the reasons that I advocate for civil liberties, and there's a lot that you've been said also, like, People are not asking about privacy because they need the service first, but I mean, for those of us that have been connected for 20 years, we are GDPR. It took us a long time to ask those questions, and we're trying to post-implement things after we'd already lost um, certain rights, right? So it's sort of trying to regain that. So it's not a us prescribing a certain worldview or me prescribing a certain worldview, but trying to understand what connects us as humans and what does technology do to us as humans and humanity and for society? So it's always a whenever you go somewhere, and my job is a lot about listening and trying to understand what the context is, I always go in with the understanding that I will not be comfortable. And that's part of being human and doing the work. It's like everyone is uncomfortable if we're genuine about driving diversity and inclusion. And I think those are the narratives that we need um, and the reason that I am privileged enough to talk about privacy is because I do live in certain countries where we, like, it, GDPR is a thing, right? And like, that people are asking it. The fact that we have it puts citizens into a position where they can start asking those questions because so many other things are already protected. That said, I do think there is a trust issue because those divides that existed in the physical world are not just being perpetuated, but they're actually being aggravated and it's getting worse. And there is a lot of exploitation happening because just give me the service because I need to get things done. And you're being put into a dependency that you have no control over. How can you develop any trust in anything that's happening around you if you have no sense of control? 
And I very strongly believe that without a space where you get to be private and not controlled by an external party where you have a say, you can't even develop as a human being. And we won't be able to engage in dialogue and shape those narratives and shape those norms if we don't know who we are. And it's impossible to develop that sense without a space where we can be private. You're also someone who was promoted and supported the idea of multi-stakeholder governance of the space. Uh, Nanjira just shared with us that perhaps uh, that is a weak space. It is incomplete, it is not representative. Uh, I see the same, same faces, same voices uh, at each of these multi-stakeholder forums. Unfortunately, I am one of them also. But, <laughs> but, but the fact is that how multi-stakeholder is multi-stakeholderism, and why should voices and communities completely disconnected with that multi-stakeholder process have any more trust in your propositions than say their own governments who at least they get to elect? Sure, and that's a very fair question and I don't think there is the perfect model for multi-stakeholderism out there or multi-stakeholder governance. In fact, I'm, I actually think that we have a lot of system change that's necessary if we really do wanna develop into a positive manner as a society. And I do think that it's not about participating in everything that's there, but it's about finding the issues and the places where citizens can actually participate. So if that's a local place where you can go and make the changes that are necessary for you, that's what needs to happen. The problem is that the way the world is structured right now is that all of those United Nations, Geneva and New York, very accessible for the rest of the world, right? Yes, most countries might be represented there, but the structure isn't set up to be fair and equitable. Mm. And so if you ask me as where do we need to go, I think multi-stakeholder governance at least tries to break up those structures in a way as opening up the power system. Because we found that like with technology, we're talking about trust and tech. The tech might scale, the accountability hasn't. So what are the new accountability mechanisms that we need to develop? And I do think involving as many stakeholders as possible is at least a, an attempt to try and make it more trustworthy and more equitable and more meaningful mm -hmm. to whoever gets engaged. So some distance to go, but perhaps it's the right direction and that's your proposition on multi-stakeholderism. But you use the word accountability. Uh, how would you like the idea if someone was to suggest that since the private sector de delivers public services, public um, uh, essentials, the boardrooms should be elected now? I'd be open to that idea. Um, I do think that it's a problem, right? Accountability is about holding power to account. And as Nigeria said, that some private sector companies have more GDPR than countries. We don't have a mechanism to hold them to account. I do think that's a problem. And that's what I mean with we need to rethink our structures and governance mechanism. And I do think maybe a way to give citizens a say in what private sector companies are doing or should do is one way to go. The final point I want to uh, uh, raise with you is the idea of, uh, you say you did mention the place where I live, I come from, privacy is a thing. Mm -hmm. Now, that was the whole uh, moment, that was the whole driver of European EU values being promoted and celebrated and perhaps even transferred to other geographies. Well, the geographies where you come from may be rethinking their own conceptions around privacy and, and, and civil liberties and perhaps even uh, some uh, settled issues around ethics. Are you at Mozilla and are you as a, as a person who's engaged with the sector, find it more difficult to be credible to, to sell certain notions to uh, different geographies when your own uh, political systems are today sending out very different messages? Um, I'm not sure it's a question of credibility. I think it's just a matter of do we ourselves believe it's the right choice and the right choice always needs to be reassessed, right? So I consider it part of my job to ask, are we still on the right track? Is this where we need to go and is this really what creates positive things? And for instance, we ran just in the, over the recent months a huge large-scale open consultation process and one of the elements that I looked into was a survey that 20,000 people from over 160 countries took. And what people told us while well, we were asking, sort of, and I mean, Mozilla does have its headquarters in Mountain View, San Francisco. I'm not having any illusions about we are definitely not as global as we aspire to be. Um, but we went in with this, so what does open and inclusion actually mean? What people came back with, and especially the free text responses were very strong on that, is like, what's the matter asking inclusion, diversity, and openness? If we don't have privacy and security, there is nothing I can trust. Because I don't trust that the person I meet online actually does me good. And what that means to me is that we've lost trust in our humanity to be able to meet a new person. And that's a huge issue. So it's, it's not so much about credibility, it's about the fact of 
what do we as a society need? And I don't think technology is the panacea that's going to fix mm -hmm. it all. I do think that we have to invest in the respect and the dialogue that we need to do. And I, I see a lot of tension coming up. And because you're asking, isn't like privacy, GDPR, Europe, do we come in with our values? I feel no, I'm like just, this, I'm just provoking you. It's sure, a post lunch session. Of course, session. and that's that, that is perfectly fine. I do see a need more and more, no matter where I am, and I do travel a lot, that people want more stability. And the Western libertarian order does not provide stability as we need them in how our societies are developing right now. So it's a conversation that we need, and I don't think it's happening where it needs to happen because it's still, and Nanjira mentioned that, and you also mentioned that, it's this being talked at rather than with. And it's not something we do on a panel, it's something we do in a conversation in, the, in person. So actually, I think that's a good point uh, for me to make a small chart, a housekeeping announcement. I think that's a great idea. I was telling someone today during the lunch break, why don't you find five strangers and by the time you leave, make them your friends? I think <laughs> it is not the panel discussions that really matter in many of these gatherings, it's what happens outside mm -hmm. that creates and builds communities and trust in, in, in <laughs> traveling the same road together. But Nanjira, quick point to you before I move to Kevin. Yeah, um, I mean, listen, one of the things that has and will remain um, a very uh, interesting contributor to this cocktail is if we think about all these orders and how digital technologies are coming to turbocharge into it, if we flip it around and go back to the very people that are not represented, you know, we have the uh, sustainable development goals mantra, leave no one behind. If those people were made the front and center of these conversations, everything we understand about the institutions we have created, about, you know, the notions we come with into different parts of the world would come falling apart. And that's a difficult job um, for many people. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the most frustrating things, especially being maybe whatever you want to call me, an African woman, yeah, whatever, whatever boxes I tick, is you're almost always forced to be, you know, the angry auntie in the room to make the point that the way everyone is imposing, even in a very conversational tone, is not at par with certain parts of the world. Mm -hmm. Going back to the conversation about these values, um, privacy, trust, security, how they manifest on this continent is very different, but because we've not been in the business of understanding it from that way, we may not use the same language the same way um, others do, but in the lived experiences, and because we've just not been accustomed to understanding those lived experiences, when you go to this uh, so-called headquarters, you assume these people don't know, they don't have views, they don't have concerns, and you move on and, and, that's, and so on and so forth. And so that understanding, and the other thing it clearly always comes to is we must always remind people, there's no, with Africa, there's no buy one, get 53 free, you know? Um, what works, and this becomes an issue with digital technologies that are going to the scale and uh, idea as the, as the panacea. Everybody wants to build the thing that will work for all the Africans, all the Indians, yeah. all of that. With very diverse people, where even you know, Kigali folks and Nairobi folks, and just cities alone I'm talking about, data protection for us has become a very necessary conversation. That's a whole other sidebar. Let's meet at the bar, I guess, <laughs> for that part. Is that because we're being forced to talk about these things at scale, everybody's supposed to have this replicable. That's what the Western order understands. We are not working with what's sustainable for communities. Mm -hmm. We're not working with what is actually appropriate for communities. And so that's what's going to continue creating these pain points. And that's why the, uh, this so-called African agenda or African design is always going to be concealed to those, the rest of you because the lens that which you're viewing the continent on these issues is still fundamentally problematic. Nigeria. Holding private companies accountable, your views on that, and how can we do that? Did, was, it, was it discussed at the UNSG deliberations? A lot, and um, that's, it's always going to come back down to jurisdiction, how um, digital technologies will port to the jurisdictions we understand in society today. So what the Kenyan government decides may not necessarily be what the Rwandese government decides, but do they find consensus and all that? One thing that is clear is that with the provision, as the uh, digital technologies become so important in our lives and in some ways becoming public goods that are being provided by private companies, we absolutely are gonna have to find ways to hold them to account. Now, the traditional sense where we elect a government and the government then does things uh, on behalf of us is a very loose notion in certain parts of mm -hmm. this world. Mm -hmm. um, so that's not exactly how we've gone about the business of accountability and all that. 
And, and time is going to tell us more and more people are getting connected and as more and more people are getting disgruntled by the different uh, corners of service they're getting from private companies, it'll be very interesting to see how the mechanisms of accountability, and India actually gave us a really good example with Facebook mm -hmm. a couple of years ago, and how um, it wasn't necessarily the government through the government that there was a pushback. It was citizens sure. themselves It was who a community-led initiative that stopped free business. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I know we have to, to, to no, talk no, yeah, through so much without context. We apologize for that. Um, but that's what I'm saying. So new ways of understanding how people are actually governed is not necessarily going to be the typical way we understand governments, private sector, civil society. For many of us, we have been our own governments. I think it's in Nigeria they say you are your own government. So how you go about the whole idea of accountability and understanding that is going to be very different. And for everybody who's trying to figure out what that next world order is, should maybe flip the whole thing from talking at us and listening to us. I think that's a great idea. Kevin, let me come to you, the world order. Um, I think that's interesting. We are told in, in, in our parts of the world, and I, I can certainly speak from the country I come from, we are told that don't trust the Chinese tech. Mm. Uh, we are told. Mm -hmm. uh, who's, who's, who's telling you that? Uh, I don't know. Someone tells us. Fake news. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's a divine voice that tells us uh, at 3 a.m. every morning, Eastern Standard Time, that don't trust the Chinese. Uh, now, the voice that tells us this was actually um, the voice that also sheepishly admitted that I had a NSA mass surveillance program using American tech. I also protect my own citizens, but I don't protect other citizens. And therefore, I want you to embrace American technology, but the protections that I offer you are protections that your government is incapable of providing to you. <laughs> now, why should, in this battle between China tech US tech, to some extent Europe tech, to some extent India tech. India is also now exporting platforms. What does the user do? And how do you see this unfolding in the larger geopolitical landscape? And is it going to really fragment the technology space? So the internet is now actually split, the digital space is fragmented, and everything that we feared would, uh, we were trying to prevent from happening has happened already. We live in a divided digital space. Well, let me try to hit the big picture of what is going on, what has changed in the United States over the past three, four years uh, that has led to this rift between the US and China that we're now seeing that has got this disembodied voice arguing to you to not trust Chinese technology. Um, the, the first point I would make that I think is very important is that US concerns about Chinese tech development and China's growing technology prowess, they both predate and will outlast the Trump administration. Uh, there is, has been for some years a contingent of defense and national security establishment voices in the United States who have been growing more and more concerned about China. Let me give you a simple reason why. Uh, back in 2012, after many years of kind of lying fallow, artificial intelligence really raced into the headlines. One of the reasons it did this was because different teams in these competitions for facial recognition started making some really extraordinary breakthroughs in the quality of facial recognition, mm -hmm. getting towards that level where it's better than a human can recognize faces. But it wasn't just the American teams who were making these breakthroughs. The Chinese it was Chinese teams as well, including at least one Chinese team backed by the Chinese military. Right, so that's, that's point one, is that the US national security establishment concern about China uh, has, has been there for a while. Um, point two, I think, is that the Trump administration, in its own unique way, has hit on this problem of technology and the social contract. The Trump administration's big change from previous administrations has not only been its willingness to use US policy tools much more aggressively than any administration before to pursue a kind of America first agenda for the global technology sector. Uh, it has also, as a matter of US national strategy, conflated national security and economic security. So the, the Trump administration 2017 National Security Strategy of the United States said, in essence, 
jobs and economic security is equal to national security in the view of the United States. The United States must act aggressively to protect what the administration calls, in a new, a new phrase that they coined, the national security innovation base, which it, which it defined, as, and I'm paraphrasing, as the entire ecosystem of US capital, talent, intellectual property, and know-how that emerges from Silicon Valley. So when those two things came together, these long-standing concerns, an administration whose America First policy equates national security and jobs, plus a president who is willing to act in a way different to other presidents okay, on these me, issues, then, then you suddenly come to where we are today. No, let, me, let, let me stop you there, because America first and technology for all, it doesn't somehow mesh together. <laughs> no, well, well, you know, let's, let's think about how we got here technologically. The past 30 years, you've had this I ideal, if not necessarily the reality, of the free and open global internet. You've had uh, the emergence of affordable consumer technologies, now still not affordable to everyone in the world, smartphones are not affordable enough, but the reason that your iPhone costs $1,000 and not $3,000 is because it can be designed in California and it can use semiconductors whose designs are, are made using software made in the United States that are, that are manufactured in Taiwan and that are assembled along with a complex array of other parts and software at, at a Foxconn plant in China. So global technology supply chains running through China have made uh, the technology industry what it is today. They've brought us to this point in the digital revolution. And what we now have with the emergence of this strategic confrontation or competition between the United States and China over advanced technologies is a risk that that entire ecosystem begins to unravel and that we're heading towards a rift where we're going to have separate technology stacks. Now, we're not, yet, we're not there yet, but we, the political winds are blowing in that direction, and emerging markets, Africa in particular, will be on the front lines of that problem if they are forced to choose between whether to embrace a technology stack that is led by Silicon Valley or one that is led by China and backed by China's quite capable contingent of digital platform companies and, and global technology companies. Can an India stack be a compromise? No, let, let, me come to, <laughs> <laughs> let me come to Nanjira and Ajit Jola to actually respond to Kevin, I think. And, and even before the stacks, because I think that's also like, uh, you know, at class 2.0 of it. Africa is already so deeply involved because the extraction of the very raw materials that are creating yeah, whatever happens in China or presently now as we're bringing more back jobs back to America is all about where it starts here. And again, the e-waste is being dumped here. Mm. So there's something there with a matter of agency that also combines the conversation about climate change mm. um, and responsible use of these technologies in the circular economy, if you will. That would be a matter of agency for our African governments to actually come to an interesting consensus on. The terms of engagement, if you will, could be very interesting. Unfortunately, right now, it just seems to be that um, maybe through misadvisement that the whole idea is let's create our own versions of everything here when that ship has sort of sailed. So yeah. that understanding of a strategic element, and I guess the African design is watch everybody, learn what not to do. That would be the strategic point uh, element and understand what assets are already being contributed because in the tech narrative that is often forgotten, the sites of extraction and the sites of dumping are still within this continent. That's important, the nickel cobalt uh, age. If, you know, as we move away from the fossil fuel age and move to the nickel, nickel cobalt age, I think technology will have far greater political implications for this continent right. than we actually are beginning to study. Yeah. Ajit Jola, yes, China tech or US tech? Well, I, I, actually, I, I think uh, this is very interesting because um, I recollect about two weeks ago... Oh, oh, which phone do you use? Uh, I, <laughs> uh, Korea, South Korea, not North Korea. But I, I recollect um, Professor Joseph Nye of Harvard said something very interesting that basically the Trump administration has weaponized interdependence. Mm. And I think this is very important because, um, for example, uh, I, I belong to a, a fintech group, and all of us, to a man and a woman, agree that our, we must develop our own IT stack. Mm. And I am sure there is no Indian, major Indian company that's not developing its own backup of backup of its own thing. So you can see that in the interdependence is actually beginning to crumble. Whether it will crumble away or somehow be resuscitated, 
Um, the other thing, and I'm trying to uh, tie this to some of your opening remarks, I think that um, the corporations, frankly, uh, government seems to be either outsourcing or abandoning some of its traditional responsibilities to the corporations. Um, I mean, very simply put, take Facebook, Twitter, Google. Arguably, they are now performing the censorship government, uh, the, the censorship function that government used to do. Now, yes, arguably, maybe governments don't have the wherewithal, but the point is, this well, shift, very, this really shift is happening. Point. That's a very interesting point. In mm. fact, many say that the current Indian elections that were completed a couple of months ago saw huge external interference Correct. because platform and uh, the Facebook and Twitter were deciding which contents to promote, which contents <laughs> to take down, Precisely. which contents to leave behind. And it was an interesting dimension. I'm going to open it up to um, those who want to join this conversation. We have around 15 minutes left, 14 minutes left. Jitin, I can see. I can see mm. another hand up there. Please walk to the mic. So. I'm going to take a bunch of questions. Walk up to the mic. The mic won't walk to you. We, uh, we are doing it differently this time. So uh, please come to the mic in the aisle. Stand there. I'm going to take a bunch of three questions. And uh, we'll turn uh, back to the panel for responses. And hopefully, we'll get a second round if they keep it short. Um, uh, and we will start with you, sir. <coughs> Introduce yourself briefly and question. Um, I'm Dr. Abdullah, Director for Africa at uh, Access Partnership. Uh, we work with uh, U.S. big tech companies. So we've been discussing here the uh, matter of trust. So I would be really interested to know how you guys can help us because I'm going to give you two examples. The first one is a month ago I went with one of the big U.S. tech companies to the West uh, African Central Bank that gathers about eight countries. Uh, the company was trying to see how to negotiate with the Central Bank which made it clear they need all the data, or at least part of it, to be stored in the region. It's a matter of trust. The big US company says it's complicated in this part of the world for security reasons, for political, whatever. So it's funny to see that. And then last week I was in Nigeria, I was talking to the gentleman here, where they're interested in a satellite solution. But at the same time, it's a US technology. They said we're interested in satellite because uh, the security issue we have in Nigeria, if you use fiber, people can go and cut it. While satellite, they can bring it down. Mm -hmm. But again, this is a US technology, so they have some concerns. And if you go to a third example, it's like the, 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 the trust between the citizens themselves and the government. I think we did not really deal with that. Um, when it comes to elections in Africa, you've noticed that in many African countries, they will cut the internet some days before, during the election, and after. So there's a matter of trust. People don't trust the government in terms of dealing with the technology. And the government does, do not really trust their citizens when it comes to where the use of technology. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let me go to the lady here. Please introduce yourself and pose the question. And then I'll come to you. Over to you. Hello. Uh, my name is Vlada Galan. I'm here from the United States. Um, in 2018, Mark Zuckerberg uh, testified in front of the United States Congress. Uh, I think it was an eye-opening experience for any of those that watched. Um, it was very sad to see how many U.S. policymakers had no idea of even the basic functions of Facebook, um, not much less uh, any other tech platforms or solutions in depth. Um, I believe the same to be on many countries around the world. Um, one of the questions under this panel in our conference booklet asks, how can governments ensure that citizens trust public tech solutions? I think this question um, can sometimes be hard to answer until we first start educating leaders and policymakers. My question to the panel is, how do we educate governments and policymakers? Um, and is this something that you see as a problem to begin with? Um, to me, it seems like they don't see uh, and seem to keep up um, with the advancement of technology and the speed at which technology moves. Uh, there seems to be a huge gap there. And I don't know how we answer some of these questions when it comes to trust. Um, so perhaps government may not even be the right vessel to build that trust. I think that's a fair question. Uh, if you don't know, can you even ask the question? And the political leaders, as you saw in that Mark Zuckerberg testimony, were clueless, right? Let me take the third intervention from Jitin and then come back to the panel. Uh, hi, I'm Jitin from India. I run a cybersecurity nonprofit. So my question is to Kevin. Uh, you spoke about, like, you know, in defense of U.S. tech, that how uh, semiconductor patents and you know Foxconn have been stolen by Chinese, and they're they're trying to leapfrog 
in the semiconductor in the industry and 5G on stolen patents. But my question is that, you know, the kind of charge sheet which FBI has fought against Huawei, and then kind of pressure America is bringing on developing economies like India, uh, where we are, we are the largest smartphone population in the world, and then the pressure which is on us to ban the Huawei. Uh, and then suddenly in between these pressures, we find a statement by you know, President Trump uh, last week that he might actually go and strike a deal with China and might give some concessions to Huawei. So what is the message? Is it like, don't deal with China till I strike a deal with them? Or if it is about really about national security, we have seen a complete erosion of trust in US tech after the Snowden revelations. Now this you know, fanatic pressures about banning Huawei and then sudden policy changes of striking a deal, Will it lead to the erosion of now trust in the U.S. tech policy? So we have lost the trust in technology. Now will we lose the trust in policy? So what is the message for developing economies? Thank you. I, I think his question really is, the, is trust in Trump implicating trust in U.S. tech? <laughs> I think that's the question he's asking. Uh, uh, let me get the gentleman here, the last intervention. Then I come back to you. I'll give you two or three minutes to respond to these questions, and we'll close the panel with that. Uh, the last intervention, please. Okay. Uh, actually, it's not a, about a question. Um, maybe just four sentences uh, as um, re recommendations uh, to Mr. Edison. Um, actually, we, have, we, we are sharing the similar background. Yet I'm working for one Chinese ICT company as leader of there. And I also have a postdoc and um, experience for international relationship. So it's just like your geo technology background. So first, uh, actually, um, Prime Minister of German, Germany, Angela Merkel, uh, was not monitored by uh, Chinese technology, but the CIA. <laughs> so um, maybe national security, um, I mean, for Chinese point products me, is not con next, convinced. Yeah, Second, me. all technologies are not one percentage safe, including Huawei, ZTE, Ericsson, or IBM. So all global communities have to be working together to solve this problem. Third, any companies that can provide cheaper and high quality products will be suitable for any countries, including Africa countries or USA or your EU. Last sentence, surely China and the US will be competing uh, continuously. But the key is not who will occupy the biggest uh, percentage of the world but to help more countries, young generation, to catch the ICT train to the future. Thank you. Uh, I think you were, you were the sixth panelist, but mm -hmm. thank you for that. Uh, 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 if you have four sentences, I can't give you. If you have one, I will give you. Yeah. One sentence. Yeah, I want to say. But not long one, no? one. one. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say technology balkanization is not helpful for the world. China and the US should cooperate to address the challenge of the, the fourth industry revolution. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Great. Nanjira, let, yeah. me, let me start with you. You Let's have uh, two minutes I know. to Treatable, respond to any of the four. Yeah. Um, on the, the, the examples that we heard right there is the unfinished business that is porting to the technology space. So gone are the days there was the illusion that the technological developments were absent to the political realities. The perceptions any uh, government has about any part of the world will port to what they will recommend or prescribe or even mandate through agreements and other instruments of investment to be the infrastructure. The question is whether the people on the other side of it have that they can bring their own skin in the game, so to speak. Policymaker readiness is a big challenge we've been discussing. It was a key gap we found with the work with the digital cooperation. And we do, in the chapter four of that report, talk about some of the mechanisms that could be there because any adult in the room will tell you, being going back to school to learn something is not something anyone is willing to do, to be honest. So finding ways to get, especially those already in the diplomatic capitals to start interacting with these issues, we found some existing mechanisms for some countries where they're doing peer-to-peer -peer engagement on how much do you not understand on this thing and let's not not understand it together. So building upon that, um, here on the continent, I work in my day-to-day -day work on that very issue of getting policymakers from different stripes, from uh, different ministries, to understand how the, to build some coherence around that. The problem overall in conclusion is with the conversations we've been having about technology, there's so much focus on the innovation, which is absolutely important, but has not been balanced often enough with the policy readiness. So then we have the narrative that innovation will always be ahead of policy. So we've, in a way, a policy space has been emasculated. You end up with what happened in the US, and there's a great Twitter thread of what would have happened if Zuckerberg went to Nigerian Senate. So you should look that up as well. <laughs> Kevin. Okay, um, 
just because there were some specific questions addressed to me, uh, is the mixed messages coming from the US about the security of Huawei uh, or, or doing a deal with trade, is that erode credibility? Yes. Uh, do I uh, agree with the comments of the gentleman, the two gentlemen on this side, that uh, US-China zero-sum competition or a perception of zero-sum competition in tech is, is uh, counterproductive? Yes, I think it will become uh, potentially very expensive if we do move to this world where we have competing tech stacks. I think that the burden of that cost will fall disproportionately on emerging economies as they are forced to choose and are forced to pay more or be delayed in their rollout of things like 5G technology. Um, I think that uh, if there's a big picture point I want to make today, just, just to conclude, I would say that if the internet, if the fundamental architecture of the internet and the digital revolution of the past 30 years had been built in a secure way, we wouldn't be having the conversation we're having today about Huawei versus US spying uh, and, and the risks associated with that. And I think that this is where, for me, it really ties together with, with climate change. Just as in climate change, where uh, rich countries around the world had generations of economic growth in which they were able to grow by burning fossil fuels without factoring in the negative externalities and costs of doing so, and are now turning to developing countries and saying, you have to, to try to achieve the same growth trajectory, but without this same, these same advantages, you have to pay more for clean energy. Uh, now, I feel like in tech, we're in much the same position. The technology world that we know it, uh, uh, that we know today evolved over 30 years in which cybersecurity, digital privacy, were sort of afterthoughts or were not really factored into fundamentally into the design of, of the ecosystem that we have today. I think that we need to move towards a new ecosystem, but that that transition will potentially be costly. It can produce new opportunities. It can produce an opportunity for uh, regions of the world that are leapfrogging to, to new technology systems to do it in a more secure way that does respect privacy, that, that per can prepare people for a world in which everything is running connected to the internet um, in, in a way that's much more secure and equitable and fair. But, but I think that the challenge facing everybody in this room and around the world is, is how to do that uh, from where we're standing today, which is not necessarily the ideal starting point. Great. Yes, that's great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I think that the last um, 30 years or so since the internet came along have had the largest amount of innovation in, in our human journey, yet has left so many people behind in America, in Africa, across the world, and that's why we have Trump. Um, so, <laughs> It, it, in a way, I really think that the, the world's problems are getting bigger and they need to be solved by everyone together. And, and the current rhetoric and direction towards, no, let, let, let's figure it out our, ourselves, let's figure it here, let's find a local solution. There are places to apply that and then there are big places like climate change and now um, the internet and its ability to stay the internet where we're all at. Um, is going to be threatened if we keep going in this direction. And I, I, I really think that um, the young generation is waiting on the big people at the table to make the right decisions so that we can have as much time to try and impact as, as many people as possible, bringing them online, giving them better access, cheaper access. And, and so I, I think it's going to be an exciting time in the next five to ten years. Ajijola. Um. Excellent questions. Thank you very much. Uh, to Dr. Abulo, I think trust. Um, the, the Ronald Reagan famously said, trust but verify. We need to combine solutions. We need to combine technology. We need to uh, combine service providers and in a way that each one cross-checks the other. Um, and actually, this means that we have to have standards. But even with standards, uh, I, would, I would challenge any of you to go and read about the ellipto electrical cryptographic algorithm <laughs> standard that was developed at the, Niger um, the American Institute of Standards, which the NSA actually penetrated the standards-making body. So that means that there's some things we need to think about doing ourselves. On the issue of internet shutdowns, in my opinion, as serious as they are, I just don't see them as sustainable. Uh, we have situations where, a few weeks ago, Elon Musk uh, launched 20 satellites at the same time. Uh, Iridium has 63 in space. 
So, you know, if you think you have your own satellite, somebody's going to have basically a little dish and uh, be able to communicate independently. Um, in terms of some of these um, basic uh, functions of trust with government, uh, yes, we do need to um, raise the awareness of the political leadership. Um, there's actually something I'm working on right now with the UN where we're trying to um, develop the first generation of cyber diplomats. Why is this necessary? It's necessary because, as I'd mentioned much earlier, states are beginning to engage in conversations about things like norms, but setting the rules for um, interstate interaction in cyberspace. And so it's not a, an IT problem, it's actually a diplomacy problem. So we need to equip our diplomats, again, from the South-South, uh, in order to be able to sit at the table and be you know, empowered to m m have these conversations and arrive at certain decisions. With regards to the third question about Donald Trump, well, I, I think there's a famous saying, do what I say, don't do what I do. Um, in terms of um, some of the issues that was brought, were brought up by the, the fourth respondent, uh, as an African, uh, I've come to the conclusion that all countries in some way, shape, or form provide backdoors. Uh, all software has flaws. It, it's made by human beings, so there will, there will be flaws. And, and, and really the question is, what are we going to do in terms of either some kind of equities process, vulnerabilities equities process, so we know what these flaws are. Um, also, I have, if you bear with me just a moment, um, uh, human beings pay for pain relief. So as Africans, we must understand that there are certain problems that we can benefit from by providing solutions. And I'll give you an example. In 2015, the Africa, I'm talking only Africa now, cybersecurity solutions market was about a billion dollars US. At the end of 2018, that market had grown to 2.32 billion dollars US. And so I put it to the Africans here. What piece of that action are you getting? To the governments here, what piece of that action are coming to your economies in terms of developing a cybersecurity solutions industry primarily driven by those below 35 years old. And of course, some of us above 35 years old are not redundant. We are the mentors for these younger people. But the point is that there is money to be made. There is legitimate income to be made simply by providing solutions to these headaches. And I will end with an African proverb. Tomorrow belongs to the people who prepare today. Thank you. I'm going to try to be super brief and not repeat what the um, other panelists have already said because there's a lot happening. But I think it's also remembering as depressing as some of those things that we're saying. It seems like everything's in flux and super complex and we can't do anything. The fact that things are in flux also means that the change is up to us. And that's quite the unique and sort of optimistic moment in time. I'm so optimistic that once we actually come with humility into the conversation while also being courageous in the points that we bring to that conversation and how we speak up, we have the chance to demand better and to actually make it happen. So in that sense, optimism and let's lose the flux to disrupt in a positive way for all of us. So I don't have an African proverb to share, but I will paraphrase. <laughs> I, will, uh, I, will, I will paraphrase Steve Jobs from many years ago. He said, stay hungry uh, and stay, stay foolish. I would say just add stay alert as well and perhaps then you can trust in tech. So uh, let's uh, paraphrase him and let's uh, believe that together through these conversations by building capabilities and by pursuing solutions that serve people and not people who serve innovation, we can create a, 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 a ecosystem that we can all trust, embrace and certainly participate in. Uh, please join me in applauding the marvelous panelists and, and please uh, 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 we have run over time. I think we are seven minutes over time, but we'll take a 15-minute tea break. We'll come back for uh, another simple question, rethinking globalization uh, next time. Around.